Hey everybody, I'm Josh and this is Bob Hall, the director of the Commercial Space Operations Center, the ComSpoc. So every day in space there are close approaches or CAs and today on uh, January 29th, 2020, there's a particularly close one that is making the news cycle. So Bob, you see close approaches all the time. Uh, this one has a pretty high probability of collision as far as collisions go. It's still pretty low probability that they will actually happen. Uh, today in this video, we are not going to be covering the probability of whether they hit or not, but we are going to go into what if they do hit and run through a debris simulation, and Bob's going to get to that. So Bob, what are we going to see today? Thanks, Josh. So what we're going to look at here is um, uh, this upcoming conjunction. Uh, we've done a, a hypothetical, if you will, using uh, engineering debris fragmentation tools to look at um, well, what, what would happen to the debris environment if these two objects were to hit. And it's based on the geometry of the engagement, the mass of the objects, the orbits of the objects, uh, and, and, and to, just to look for what, what would happen in terms of number of objects that could be created, uh, in this case, uh, one centimeter or greater. So there are a lot of debris models out there, and there have been three major debris generating events in recent history that are used to calibrate these models. So there's the 2007 Chinese ASAT, there's a 2009 Iridium Cosmos collision, and there was a 2019 India ASAT test. So those events helped build some of these models, and the one that we're going to show today uh, was developed by Dan Oltragi for the Center for Space Standards and Innovation, and we generated a, a debris simulation. It figured out, it estimated a number of pieces of debris that would be generated, and Bob's going to get into a little bit more of that now. Right. Thanks, Josh. So, so again, we're, we're not saying that this is actually going to be a collision, although uh, as we sit here today, a few hours out, I'm seeing people estimating numbers like 1 in 100, 1 in 20, which sounds really low. Uh, you know, if you were going to go bet on an event in Vegas and, and your odds were 1 in 20, that they wouldn't be great odds. But in the space community, uh, for a conjunction, you get numbers higher than like 1 in 10,000, and spacecraft operators get really nervous and start to plan mitigation um, procedures. Uh, and certainly 1 in 1,000 people are doing things to, to move their satellite out of the way to the extent they can. So while it sounds in real-world numbers really low, for a space event, these numbers are really, really high. It uh, doesn't mean it's going to happen. But we thought it'd be prudent to kind of get a sense for what might happen based on the, again, the mass of these objects, the size of these objects, the, um, the, the geometry. And so what we have here is we have the GGSC, uh, which is a gravity gradient uh, experiment. It was actually a secondary payload on a satellite called Poppy. Um, and then um, we have this uh, IRAS satellite. They're actually coming from different directions, but as you can see here, they're, they're kind of uh, we're going to see it very quickly. They're kind of coming almost head on. Now, I've got this set right now to uh, 2330 uh, UTC, which is about uh, 630 uh, on the East Coast local time. And the event is about nine minutes later. So I'm going to move forward in time. And, and right there, you see in this, in this notional impact, we've started to generate some debris fields. Uh, actually, we, 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 the analysis generated them. And what's happening is now they're, they're starting to scatter. So I'm, I'm moving this around so we get a sense for how that happens, how they spread out. So these satellites are about how high? They're about 800 kilometers high, okay, and that's which is probably the densest part of the LEO environment. Lower in terms orbit, of right. yeah right in terms of objects so the but, ISS is below them well below that yes right but as you're showing in the simulation is the debris that gets generated spans altitudes oh yeah yeah we'll we'll get back to that that's a great point but but uh, the, the dispersion if you will is pretty broad here and you notice that how how high they've spread out above and below the initial orbit line and you also see uh, on the Earth if you can if you can notice there's a bunch that are on the Earth here. Those are objects that would have uh, re-entered the atmosphere. Uh, the, I've got this scenario set up to uh, turn them off after a short period of time because otherwise they get visually confusing. And so you see they're going to And most off. likely they'd all burn up size yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, first of all, these satellites are, are not so massive. I, even if the satellite were to re-enter intact, what I mean by that, if it were to decay into the atmosphere intact, there's a large likelihood that uh, it would all burn up and none of it would make it to the surface. And certainly if, if it's been fragmented in a hypervelocity collision, 
uh, you would imagine that most of the pieces are small enough that even though we show this, what that means is they got low enough and they burn up in the atmosphere. I, I, so, I so highly you, doubt that you know pieces are going to rain down on somebody. So you said the hypervelocity. It's a good word there to, to explain to people who aren't necessarily familiar with these things. You said they're approaching almost head on. So they're almost in worst case scenario. Now, we don't know attitudes about these things because they're old uh, retired satellites. But when, how fast are they going at the closing velocity where they hit each other, the hypervelocity? Uh, that's a great question. I believe it's around 14 kilometers per second. So you notice here the debris spread uh, in altitude, and also notice how each plane is filled with debris here as we go. And the, the, the way to really get a sense of that, if, if I go all the way back to the beginning now and just, just let it animate. So you're, you're scrubbing time is what Yeah, I'm, I'm moving the timeline back and forth, uh, hopefully not making it too confusing. There's the initial event, and let's look at it sideways. And notice the tremendous uh, uh, vertical dispersion, I'll say. Yeah, altitude Radial dispersion. dispersion. Seems. Uh, and that has to do with the geometry uh, and what the uh, debris modeling tool has told us in this case. Uh, and then very quickly, within about a rev or so, I've, I've got a, a full closed uh, rev of debris, some of it very far away. Uh, and this Now, what I'm showing you here is uh, things that are one centimeter or greater. Now, uh, there's no systems I'm aware of out there that track down a one centimeter. Uh, one centimeter is this kind of um, nasty uh, part of the regime in that something one centimeter will be a mission killer to an active satellite should it hit it, but none of the systems that we have today, ground-based systems we have today, can track things down to one centimeter. There are systems that track, say, 10-ish centimeters, maybe a little bit less. There are some that say they can track down to two centimeters. Uh, I'm not aware of any that track down to one centimeter. So we have this kind of uh, blind spot, if you will. Uh, and so each one of these would represent, uh, these are not all between one and two or between one and 10. Many of these could be trackable. And so that's the other part of the problem. As we, if, if this were to happen, I now have many more objects in the catalog that an operator has to deal with. The operator might get conjunction warnings about uh, this new piece of debris and their satellite. And, and again, notice that the, the, the guys that went low kind of uh, deorbit or they, they, they re-enter. Uh, there are some guys that went high, including way out here, which is pretty interesting. The, did they the, go all the way out to Geo? Uh, some of them there. actually did. Now, the preponderance, though, you see, kind of stays at that altitude. And that's why this, at least for the time being, now, obviously, we would, you would really want to simulate this over decades, uh, and some of it would eventually come down. But um, satellites that operate in this band, you know, if you imagine that even half of what I'm showing is, is a new trackable piece of debris, that's that many more conjuncting objects that have to be dealt with. Now, you asked a question about... Geo, I'm going to switch. I'm going to show you something here. This is what we call a Gabbard plot. So this shows from the event for a given object the height of apogee in blue and the corresponding height of perigee in orange. So over here, I have objects that uh, go slightly higher and, and then come, the, the perigee comes down, they actually re enter. Uh, but you see a, a tremendous dispersion here, including. Many objects whose apogee goes out beyond this dotted line is the geo altitude. Uh, and for reference, the, uh, the dotted uh, green line here is the iridium altitude, which is not all that dissimilar from where this event would take place were it to happen. Uh, so, again, not saying it's going to happen. These are some sort of quick look engineering analyses in terms of uh, what sort of problem we might be faced with, uh, especially given all these... Um, the, the, the high odds and close approach. Last, I'm seeing numbers like uh, 12 meters, 14 meters, 21 meters conjunction. Uh, but what's important to note is one of these objects, GGSE, um, has these long booms. From what I can tell, it has three 18 meter booms on it. So the, the other satellite might miss the body of GGSE, but could 
whack or get whacked by one of these booms, uh, which would likely not create much of a debris field for GGSE, although, again, hypervelocity, not sure how those, those uh, processes would, would unfold, but it would certainly destroy uh, IRAS. And, and a similar thing happened in 1997 with the French Cerise satellite, which hit um, a, a, rocket, a piece of rocket body debris. It had a boom. And as far as the industry could tell at the time, what happened is the boom got hit by the debris. The satellite went tumbling. I forget if they ever eventually kind of restabilized it. There's a ton of evidence that it was the boom of Ceres was hit because I believe that they were able to still talk to the satellite. They saw the tumble rate increase, and I think they got it under control. I'm not sure. Again, that was uh, a long time ago. That certainly could happen here because this guy has three 18-meter booms. That feeds into the challenge of trying to compute probability of collision. Do I use the, the volume or the, the radius, if you will, of the body of GGSE? Or do I take a, a, a hard body radius that encompasses the 18-meter booms, most of which is empty space? Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's very tricky uh, conjunction to analyze. But hopefully... Uh, this so is, in just a few hours from now, they will have this close approach and hopefully nothing happens. Right. And if it does, we may not get indications for a couple hours after that based on the amount of debris that's tracked. But we're going to keep an eye on the situation. And uh, like we said, hopefully nothing happens. If it does, the best we can hope for is to learn from it and improve our models to plan for the future. Bob, did you have anything else to add on this? Well, I was going to say, if, if you look at what I've done here, I, I've gone, uh, this is about 14 minutes after. And you know what? I, I don't have the, the field of view of various sensors, but I know that, for example, the, the U.S. Air Force, now Space Force, has got a worldwide set of radars, uh, and probably uh, there are radars in this vicinity here that would pick this up. So within 14, 15 minutes, they would see um, what we call a multiple head count off the radar instead of one object. So pretty quickly thereafter, people could tell. The other thing is that there are folks who may be trying to uh, point their cameras uh, at this spot in space, folks on the East Coast hoping to catch a glimpse of this. I, I believe on a regular day, IRAS uh, is about visual magnitude four, so it would be observable. We just so. did a quick video on how to do that, so check that one out if you want to go out and look for this event tonight. All right, thanks, Bob. Sure.